Yeah, they're good people. You know, mm -hmm. New Yorkers are great. Yeah, they really they, are. They might be cold when you first meet yeah, them, but, but they have to be when you're meeting a million yeah, people on yeah, the street. Yeah, that's exactly what it is. But I tell you what, salt, I'm salt of the earth, you know, um, that I I know personally. Your New Yorkers are solid. Yeah. So, Nils, Nils, you, you grew up where? I was born in Brooklyn, New York, and um, I was in Brooklyn until I was five years old. And my dad, who was a New York City firefighter, decided to get out to the suburban part of the city, which was Staten Island. Um, spent pretty much my childhood in Staten Island, uh, except for my sophomore year of high school, I lived in Ireland. Um, my mom is an Irish immigrant, so I'm first generation American, very grateful. Um, my father had gone through a very bad cancer in 1978. He was diagnosed with end-stage non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and was more or less sent home to die. And uh, one of the doctors approached him and said, we'd like you to be a test pilot for this uh, new drug we're working on. And he said, I'm not a pilot, I'm a fireman in this you know, Brooklyn accent. And they explained to him, no, we, you're gonna die anyway, so why don't you give this a try? And uh, my dad did. He, uh, he went through chemo every two weeks for four years and it was brutal. It was uh, a vicious, strong drug and it uh, saved his life. He's still in remission and he's turning 84 tomorrow. Oh, wow. Yeah, so uh, my dad is my uh, inspiration. That's and I uh, have a tattoo on my arm. It says my example, my hero, my father with his badge that I eventually took over on a fine apartment. So uh, it's a good man. He, he, he filled my soul with uh, goodness and benevolence. He just always does the right thing. And uh, my Irish mother, same, same sort of person, just uh, salt of the earth, do anything for you. But what had happened is once my father was in remission, he had enough years to retire. And my mom's fear was that he would succumb to the cancer eventually. So her safety net was back in Ireland. Um, there was, she was one of 10 children. And at that point, they all had kids and my, my grandmother had just passed. So we decided, my parents decided, I didn't want to really do it. They packed it in and we moved to Ireland. And uh, back in the early 80s, it was uh, bad times economically there. And my father couldn't find work and uh, his pension wouldn't be enough to sustain, you know, us as a family. So uh, my dad decided uh, after just short of a year, we were coming back. But I had a great experience there. Um, went to a small uh, school out in a rural Irish town uh, run by the Christian Brothers, which I was familiar with because I have attended Catholic high school here. And one of my, uh, my favorite, I guess, stories was uh, there was only about 12 or 13 of us in each grade. And they had put me back a grade because they start much younger there and their curriculum is different. So one of my uh, classmates, Mike Hennessy, who I remember was a smaller guy, and uh, adopted me as his bodyguard. So Mike, uh, unfortunately, would puff up standing behind me and uh, pick fights with the upperclassmen. So uh, it started to get a little old because I wasn't getting paid. But uh, Mike one day picked it, and I ended up in a fight with about 12 guys from junior year. And uh, I'm fighting for my life, just throwing haymakers, and uh, I'm not much of a, a fighter. I'm, you know was bullied quite a bit as a younger kid and I despise bullies, but I was in a fight for my life. And as I looked over one of the Christian brothers who was this towering old Irishman with white hair, he's just standing there with his arms folded, staring at me. And I'm looking, his name is Brother O'Keefe. And I'm like, brother, any minute now, please bail me out. I need a lifeline. And all of a sudden he just finally came over and broke it up. And he pulled me to the side and he says, Jesus, I thought I was watching the quiet man himself, which was the old John Wayne movie fighting all these Irishmen. He says, you, you were doing great, Yank. And I said, brother, you, you, I was getting pummeled. He said, ah, no, I just wanted to see what you had. You did just fine. You'll be grand. And I kind of, I guess, uh, made my bones with those guys. They respected the fact that I didn't cave into them, but uh, I took a good beating. And uh, came back to America, uh, went back to my old high school, unfortunately fell behind, failed out. So I ended up in public high school down the road to finish up. So I didn't really get to graduate with my classmates, which was a little tough for me. You know, I didn't really make a bond with within one year of being in the other school, but I, I held my own. Came back to uh, play baseball, which was my love at the time. Uh, played quite a bit of Little League and Babe Ruth ball. 
And I came home to find out that one of my best friends from my team was in the process of dying from leukemia. And it was heartbreaking because I had moved away not knowing it and came home and it was too late. It was too late to see him. Um, he was in hospice and, um, you know, it, it, it really hit me. It affected me, I guess, in a great way because my father was always on that cusp of dying for quite a while. And my grandfather, who was my, my best friend in the world, uh, I'm his namesake. And I kind of didn't like my name as a kid. You know, Nils was a little different and uh, odd compared to most people. But now I kind of love it because it's, it's unique and different like me. Um, but Grandpa Nils had died, and now my father was in the process of maybe dying, and now I lost a dear friend. And death kind of, I guess, grabbed a hold of me that's really never let go since. Um, I've always had a, a huge uh, respect for it, I guess you can say, or maybe, maybe it's an intimidation thing. Uh, feared it, but not to a point that I couldn't live and function, but... So it was kind of in the back of my mind and, and there was a lot of death. There was a lot of close relatives and neighbors and friends. And it just seemed like it just never really receded. But life moved on pretty good. I uh, love baseball, but uh, I knew from probably you know, five years old, I wanted to be a fireman like my father. Uh, you know, we used to grow up with heroes and I'm not sure how many heroes are left, you know, legitimate heroes. Uh, people that inspire you to be a better person, better human being, better man. And my father did that. And I remember witnessing at such a young age what he did. It was, it was powerful. You know, uh, my mom would bring us by the firehouse once in a while to bring him a little snack. You know, we, we cook in the firehouse. We live there, we eat there, but we just go to see him. And I remember just walking in, seeing these giants with mustaches and, and you know, they fuss over you and they put you on a truck and you put on a helmet and a coat and you're walking around thinking, man, yeah, you know, five years old, I could, I could do this. You know, they're feeding you ice cream and cake and cookies. And it was like, it was just like going to a party and uh, the smell in the firehouse of the truck and, and the, the diesel and the, the tires and the smoky gear. Cause you know, back, back in the seventies, I mean, they were busy. There was a lot of fires in New York city. There was a lot of, uh, social reasons, uh, unrest. There was a, a program where people would burn themselves out to get a new house. So anytime I went to that firehouse, just, you know, your olfactory sense is so strong. And I just, I don't know, it just, just triggered something. And then when we lived in Bay Ridge till I was five, there was a firehouse right on the corner. Uh, and so I used to sit on that corner with my little big wheel. My mom would be out in her beach chair talking with the neighbors and and I'd just be waiting for these guys to come out and occasionally my dad's truck would get pulled down there so if there was a fire in that district they call it a relocation they'll they'll pull other fire companies from various areas to kind of backfill so you know one day I'm there and here comes my dad down on the truck and I'm like holy you know just my dad and I'm racing up to see him so I'd sit at that corner and then when they would come out on calls. I just raced down alongside of them for a good 20 feet and they'd be laughing and then they were gone. Uh, so yeah, I just got hooked, got hooked at a young age uh, with that whole world. And, you know, they were good role models. They, I remember my dad's, you know, buddies, they carpooled to Staten Island and, you know, they, they'd come by the house for coffee after a long through the night shift and sit and just talk about what happened at night. and hear the stories and you know one of my dad's friends mr moran he was just such an animated character he's airborne ranger in korea and you know just i just felt like i was sitting amongst giants like just looking up hearing these stories um so that was my dream i was focused on it um i had a chance actually to try out for major league baseball um i was i was a pitcher center fielder first baseman and uh, I threw, pitched really fast, but really wild, like a Mustang. And uh, unfortunately, could never really harness that. So my skill set wasn't uh, enough to make it to the majors. So I settled for uh, joining the Army and then down the road, uh, joining the New York City Police Department, knowing that I was just waiting out on a list to get on the fire department. Um, my father had, had motivated me to take all the civil service tests that were available in the city. 
So I was kind of trapped in a world of heavy manual construction, demolition, uh, really, I'm glad I did it, it but it was, it was a tough, tough job. Uh, got laid off from that during the economic crisis, I guess in the 80s, and I worked in a nursing home as an orderly on midnights, uh, cleaning and tending to elderly male patients that were bedridden. And it was, uh, it was humbling. It was really humbling because you realize that, you know, we're fragile. Uh, we think we're in control, we're independent and, you know, on both sides of life and in infancy and in the elderly years, you're, you're, you need other people to take care of you. So I, I kind of took it as a high honor to, to tend to these older men because um, many of them were World War II veterans and uh, some from Korea. And they all wanted to teach you their, their lessons in life or reinforce their failures and, and ask you as a young, as I was 18 at the time, 19, to not make the mistakes they made. And I learned to listen uh, at times in life that kind of wavered. I, you know, whatever, you just get caught up in your own being. But at that point in time, I really learned to listen. And some of the stories were fascinating. You know, I, I, I had one gentleman that was a, one of the first uh, motorcycle police officers in New York City. And he proudly had pictures of himself back in like the late 20s on a motorcycle. And it was just incredible, you know, to say, wow, here's this. 85 year old man or 90 year old man, but they had a life and they had a story and they, they wanted to tell it to anyone who would listen. So that really made a big impact. That wasn't a job I held for a long time. Uh, I've had many jobs. Um, I have to say the best job I've ever had, which I still actually have is being a father, uh, being a dad. I have three beautiful, uh, Sorry, just I, I I never thought I'd live to see them grow and prosper into these beautiful adults that they are, these contributors to this world. And I've held multiple jobs, and many of them brought me such satisfaction, such joy. I I was joyous to get on the fire truck to help people, but uh, the the joy of of being a father. Uh, surpasses anything in this world, you know, and, and I, and I think it's actually a, a, a salient problem in, in the society we're in uh, worldwide. Um, there's a lack of fathers, you know, you, when you, when you take it upon yourself to, to have this child with, with a woman and not follow through, um, not take the full responsibility of the nurturing and development and guidance of that little human being, in this crazy world, you're doing everybody a disservice. And, uh, you know, I, I've come across people in my own life that, that have been abandoned um, by their dads at birth, young age. And their life's been so tormented because of that, because they had so many doubts about themselves. They, they couldn't understand, was it them? Were, were they not worthy of his love? Or, you know, the why, it, the why tormented them. And I get really aggravated at, at people just throwing all these excuses around. And, you know, I, I've been told I have privilege and I, and I get a little bit upset because I say, you're right, I do. I'm privileged to have two parents who loved me, who sacrificed everything of themselves for the betterment of myself and my brother and my sister. And my wife and I committed to that same track when we had our, our children, we have three children, and she left her career and, and I took it upon myself to always have two, a lot of times three jobs to keep her home raising them, uh, to try to put them in a little better of a school because the school district we were in was, was a little dicey and I didn't want them getting bullied like I did and harassed and beat up. And there was days when I felt like wow, do I ever do anything for myself or my wife? Like, is it just all about the kids? And the reality is, yeah, until they're adults and you can get them on their own, it's all about the kids. So, you know, I like to opine about a lot of things. Um, personally, I hate politics. I think politicians are all liars. So I'm, I'm a uh, independent, I'm a free thinker. 
And to me, you could solve so many of the societal ills by trying to bring back a family structure. You know, I, I asked my mom and my dad, I said, what do I do? What, you know, when I had my first daughter, it was, it was overwhelming. I'm like, this little soul. And I'm like, bring it, bring her home and you know, crying. She needs to eat. And I'm like, holy shoot, what do I do? And my mom, my Irish mother said, they don't come with a manual. You know, you just, you just love them and you figure it out. And, and it's true. And, you know, I, I just uh, took public transportation to get over here. We're in the middle of New York City. And it's sad as a father to see so many young, broken souls that are lining the sidewalks. And today is, you know, impressively hot. It's, it's 100 degrees. Um, I, I've been to fires that weren't quite as hot. I mean, you know, you ride the subway in New York City with 100 degrees. You feel like you just entered, entered the confines of hell. But I look at these broken souls and they're laying there and they're listless and they're begging and they're hooked on drugs and they're 19. They've given up already and they really haven't even lived life. They're still babies. You know, when you're 19, you're a baby. And, you know, I was out in Denver a little while back visiting someone and, uh, you know, a buddy of mine, we decided to take in a baseball game and, you know, we're walking downtown and walking to the stadium. And there was just this litany of fractured souls everywhere. Young people just with tents and shanties and signs. And, you know, they were begging. And, and if you didn't give them money, they were cursing you out. And I'm going, you're 19. How are you so jaded and broken and angry at this point in life? You haven't even experienced it. And then I stopped and I realized that I said, they probably have a broken life. They don't have anyone who loves them and guides them. And, and you know, I'm not going to say that every person that's loved and guided will not fall down and, and hurt themselves by their activities. But, you know, what my parents taught me and I taught my, my kids is every action causes a reaction. Every action that you commit comes with a response. It's either going to be a reward for your hard work and your, your being a good person or a, a consequence. And sometimes that consequence is severe. It'll cause you addiction. It'll cause you incarceration. It will cause you getting killed, overdosed, dead in a car accident. And it's, it's really simple. It's, it's just like when we used to have roadmaps, right? You know, we'd, we'd go, where am I going? No, not on the phone, you know. You had to look at a map and you had to guide your course and go, oh crap, okay, that's where I'm going. And you know, I, I think we're just taking down all of the, uh, the guides, you know, like when I was a kid, my dad liked bowling and you know, we didn't really go a lot because he was always working and he was sick. But the few times he took us when we were little, they put up the barriers on the side of the lane because, you know, you're little and you're just going to throw the ball and it's going to go in the gutter. So that barrier prevented you from ending up in the gutter and, and you hit some pins. But then as you got a little older, if you really want to learn how to bowl, you got to take the barriers down and you got to learn how to keep the ball in the middle. It's kind of like life. You know, if we keep these barriers up for, for young people, um, all people of any age, and just keep letting them repeat their mistakes with no consequences. You know, uh, I'm not saying that somebody, you know, who, who gets hooked on something or, or whatever, you know, needs to be put in jail for life or whatever, but we can't keep rewarding mediocrity or listlessness or just not giving a shit, right? Like, like how do you reward that? And, and you know, I see sometimes even my kids, they're, they're really hard working. They study, they train, they, you know, at what they're all gearing toward in life. And now it's being held against them. They're being told that, oh, it was easy for them. And, uh, you know, they went to a better school and they, their parents paid for it or this and that. It's like, no, bull crap. You know, you could go to the best school in the world and still be an F up if you don't apply yourself. Right. And, and that's what just really tweaks me is that so many people now are, are making excuses for failure and, I do believe in redemption. I believe in second chances, third chances. But after a while, it just it just starts to get old, you know. Um, 
Yeah, so so uh, I'm sorry. I'm just kind of veering no, I, all I, I over the place. I think it's what you just said a few minutes ago. You loved your kids. I love them. They're my life. And because you loved your kids, they know that they're worthy of love. So they yeah. end up loving themselves. They learn how to love themselves. Yes, yeah, you're you're right, Mark. They did, and and they love and, others. And, and these kids, these people that you're talking about that are on the streets or involved in drugs or whatever it is, they never had that. Yeah, they and, they're, parent, and they're so worthy of. Their love. parent bailed, and was that the message is that you're not worthy of love. Yes, and you and, can't love yourself, and there you go. And their self worth then is, is just crushed, and and they go through life with that seed of doubt in your head forever. Yeah, and and I think I think that's really one of the common denominators of of. I feel like our country's failing in a lot of ways, right? Um, you know, all the technology and, and advancements that we have, it's, it's like life seems to be receding in quality. You know, they, they talk about like a misery factor, right? And, you know, I'm, I'm going to be 55 years old in a few couple of months, and I just feel like I've never seen such a level of unhappiness and... Uh, jadedness and uh, almost people are just like disenf disenfranchised they've been you know i don't know how to explain it like they're just the soul's been pulled out of them and they've just given up you know um and look i understand you know faith is a, is a is a very touchy subject right in today's times um i happen to have a very strong faith um but i don't infuse it on other people if they ask me about it, I'll gladly tell them and, and why I believe and, you know, what have you. But I would never impose that on someone else. You know, I, I'm, I'm, I guess, very libertarian in my life. I feel like, look, this is your life. This is mine. Don't force me to do or believe in what you do, and I won't do it to you. But the one thing I think that a common, uh, I guess you can say, you know, ingredient of life is love. I don't care where you live in the world, your culture, your background is everybody except for a complete sociopath wants to be loved and cared about. They want to feel like they matter. And I, you know, I'm not going to say every person that I've come across is going to like me. Right. I'm an opinionated guy. Um, I was a boss in the fire department, a lieutenant, not, not a chief, you know, failed the captain's test twice. But I remember Captain I used to drive, loved him. One of, one of my mentors, my ins inspirations, John McGuire, uh, I used to drive him in 114. And he used to say to me, we called him the Duke. He just had an elegant way of, of carrying himself. And, and like, he was a good boss, a firm boss, not hard, but fair, but, but you knew what he wanted. It was no BS. And he said to me this, he said, when you make it to boss, he goes, if the assholes don't like you, I mean, you're doing your job and you're doing it well. So uh, I'm not going to lie to you and say every first responder that I work with, I was EMS for a very short time, NYPD for almost two years, New York City Fire for almost 22. Not every single responder I work with was, was the greatest human being in the world, but 99% of them are. They went to work where they were willing to give up their life for me, for you, any stranger that you just saw out in the street. That's pretty profound. You know, a friend of mine is a corporate guy. He just said it to me recently. He said, you know, I've dedicated my life to, to, to a job where I don't think there's one person in my office or my firm that would say, I'll die for you today. Well, every single person I work with felt that way with me and, and me with them. So I, I took that as a very, very high honor and responsibility. But when it came to being a boss, you know, if, if someone was harassing another guy for a certain reason or, you know, there was just things that happened, I didn't let it stand. Um, I was bullied bad as a kid, right? Because I was, I was always a pretty big kid. Now I'm a little too big. Uh, but, but I got bullied really badly. And it was, it was in the height of my father being so sick. So emotionally, I was, I was in a bad place and my granddad died. And I, you know, I thought the world was ending. And then I had this one guy every day, I'd get off the school bus and boom, he punched me in the stomach. It was just like, just to humiliate me and make me cry in front of 30 other kids. And that happened every day. And that sucked. And when I started to get 
older and bigger, my father at one point said, look, you know, you're going to need to start working out and do a little boxing because I had this one neighborhood bully. I'll never forget it. He was three years older than me. Picked the fight with me. I got him into a headlock and, and I said, OK, Frankie, you know, you're trying to prove your point. Let's just let this go because my father always says it takes a man to walk away from a fight. So I was so proud to, to know I could have just pummeled the piss out of this guy, but I let him go. Well, he came running back around, four shots to my nose. I was done. And I went home crying and I said to my dad, but dad, you told me it takes a man to walk away from a fight. And I was 12 and I was crushed. And he said, no, no, you misunderstood me. He said, I don't want you looking for fights, but you have to defend yourself. Now let me teach you how. So once I started on that path, I, I took it upon myself to sort of be the anti-bully. Um, God made me big for a reason. I'm going to put my bigness in the way of bad and evil. And there's one incident that kind of haunts me still because I didn't know how to handle it. And I was 16 and I was in football camp and I was the new guy on the team. And we were up in this, these cabins upstate and one of the kids in my cabin was a freshman from my neighborhood, just a real character, a really nice, nice kid. He, he reminded me of, uh, the catcher from Sandlot, that kid uh, always screaming at Smalls. I forget his name, he had that chubby look. And, and I remember one night, a bunch of the seniors, the big, the big dudes, the jocks, the starters, they came in in these like weird outfits and they started pummeling this kid and they pushed him down and they violated him. They, they took this stick and they put it in his rectum and made him cry and did it, you know, until they stopped laughing. They did it for maybe 30 seconds, a minute. And I sat there horrified and I felt like a coward because there was 12 of them and it was me. And finally I just snapped and I said, you know, you, you guys are you guys are assholes, you're cowards. What the frig are you doing? What are you, what are you doing to this kid? You sick bastards. And then they got pissed and they, whoa, F you, and they stormed out. Well, the next day I practice, now I'm the tackling dummy, right? They got all these big dudes. Now they're gonna tackle the shit out of me and not even tackle, but hit and spear and crush me and, you know, to try to send a message. But I had asked the kid, I said, do you want me to tell the coach? Do you want me to tell someone? And he cried, please, no, no, I, please don't. If, if, if you do, I'll be marked, I'll be, I'll be done. And I listened to him and I didn't go forward, not because I was scared. I didn't care that these guys were gonna crush me. I, I frigged them, but I didn't want to betray his friendship. I didn't want to lose his, you know, believing in me and his trust. So I didn't say anything. But you know, back, back in the early '80s, sexual assault wasn't really a thing. Like it wasn't, I guess, in the public eye. So I didn't really know. Like I kind of knew what happened, but I, I was having a hard time processing it. And now I just look back and I go, man, I wish I would have done something. But, you know, forward of that event, um, you know, I took it upon myself to defend the weak and the innocent. And, you know, I took a couple of ass kickings in, in, in between, but, you know, uh, didn't matter. I stopped, I stopped the bullying and that's all that mattered. And I guess that's partially why I was, I was gravitating towards a life of civil service and military service. You know, I was in the reserves for, eight years army reserve and uh because i liked i like to be a protector i like to help you know it wasn't like this some people say oh that you know certain guys with a messiah complex or this or it wasn't that it was just this sense of benevolence that was put into my soul by my watching my dad watching his example I mean, he didn't even want me to be a fireman because he, he knew it was dangerous and he got sick from it and when he realized how much I wanted it, then he, then he told me, go and, re, you know, study, go be a boss. Um, so I, I thoroughly took uh, satisfaction out of, out of being a protector. You know, the fact that people called us at their worst moment um, and trusted us to fix it. You know, when I was a police officer, it was a little different. And I don't really know how any of those uh, police officers now do that job today. Even back in the late 80s, it was brutal. I remember 
Uh, I got assigned to Alphabet City, which is East 2nd through 14th Avenue A through D down in Lower Manhattan. And at the time, it was overrun with crack. Um, the height of the crack wars, New York City had 2,500 homicides a year, most of it related to crack. And uh, I got dropped off by a city bus as a newly minted police officer on a five degree night, four nights before Christmas, because I graduated the academy on the 20th. And on the 21st, I was walking a beat in this neighborhood. And we walked, we each had our own block by ourselves. And I'm going, holy crap, I'm 20 years old. I'm, I'm a sitting duck out here. I was scared to death. And they would literally drop bathtubs and toilet bowls and huge pieces of, of wood and whatever off the roofs of the burned out tenements to keep us off the block so they could deal, so they could deal their drugs. So one night, I think I had a week on the street and they could see you had a brand new uniform, you had a shield with no awards over it. They know, the, 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 as we call them, the skells, the, the criminals, they, they knew right away. So they're going to see what you have. And I had a guy, he robbed a store with a, with a fake shotgun. It was a couple pipes wrapped up in tape and he went in and took the money and I see him. I, I got the call, someone must have saw it, called it and he's 100 yards away. And I go sprinting down the street and I was much leaner guy back then. I was, I was a sprinter in high school also. And he sees me and as he goes to turn around, I'm like, oh my God, do I shoot him? Do I, what do I do? And lucky for me, he tossed the, the, the faux shotgun underneath a car. So now I, I lunge and I grab him and I didn't even have a chance to call back up. I was by myself. So I get a handcuff on him and I'm trying to twist him back so I can get the second cuff on, but he's fighting me and he's spinning and he's trying to punch me. So luckily with my other hand, I got off on my radio and in New York City, signal 1013 means send everybody, send the cavalry, this is really bad. And signal 1085 is kind of when you need some help, but you don't want everybody coming because you're a little embarrassed that you need the help. So I just said, you know, narcotics post 82, uh, you know, can I get a unit on an 85? And this older cop heard the, the fear, the trepidation in my voice, and he just came flying down the street and uh, pulled up in the car, told dispatch, central, no further, no further, which means we're here, we've got this, don't, don't have people racing in to get hurt. And he just calmly comes out the car. He's an old legendary guy, Donnie. And he grabs the guy and he just boom, boom, hits him in the face twice. Guy goes down, takes his handcuffs out, cuffs him, takes mine off, hands me my cuffs, he lifts the guy up. He says, son, where are you from? I said, sir, I'm from Staten Island. He goes, yeah, me too. This ain't effing Staten Island. This is effing Alphabet City. And he goes, you see that corner over there? And there's a monument, there's a, there's a street sign. And it was two officers that were his best friends. Rocco Lori and John Foster, one white officer, one African-American officer, sitting in a patrol car together. They were assassinated in the early 70s. He says, you know who those guys are? I said, yes, sir. We used to, there's, there's a school named after them in Staten Island. I said, we used to play against them in basketball. <clears throat> he goes, yeah, those are my best friends. He goes, he takes the guy, boom, hits him again. He says, you see what you're wearing? You're the law. You see this? This is a mutt. A mutt you do not reason with. You understand me? Hits him again, throws him in the patrol car. He said, welcome to Alphabet City, son. Get tough or get dead. Don't worry, I'll bring him in. I'll clear it with the sergeant because the guy now is beating, you know, bleeding. And I stood there horrified and I went, holy crap. If the fire department doesn't call me, I got to do this for 20 years before I can get a base pension. I don't think I'm going to make 20 days. And, you know, it, it got a little better. I mean, I, you, know, you get better at it. You, you, you have guys like Don who, you know, he's passed now, but like, you know, he was there in the 60s and the 70s when it was riots and just calm as a, cool as a cucumber, just doing the job. And you had guys like him that wanted you to do well, wanted you to inspire you to do better. And, you know, one of my, like, I guess, I don't know, things I hate about society now is everybody's an influencer, right? Everybody's a content creator and an influencer. 
Well, an influencer is somebody that wants you to buy something, buy the crap that they're selling, wear the crap that they're selling, wear the perfume or, or the cologne or what the hat, what they, that, that they're only there for commerce, right? I like inspirers. I still hope I can be that to my kids and other kids or young people that are willing to listen. But influencers are just, you know, they're robbing people of their, their own minds, right? These young people are so hooked up on, uh, I don't have my phone right now, but that, that device, right? You know, my father, my father used to call the, the TV the idiot box and he'd say, get away from the idiot box and read a book or you're going to ruin your mind. And to me, I don't really say it, but I look at the phone and I'm guilty of it. I, I needed to get here for my train ticket for, you know, you, you can't function without it. But the phone is ruling people's lives and they're almost like zombies on the phone. And I call it a zombie box sometimes to myself. I'm like, look at these people. They're walking in front of you. I had a guy the other day, I'm riding a bicycle. He's coming right at me. One hand, he's reading his phone. I go right he just goes right. He, he wasn't doing it on purpose. He just wasn't paying attention. I go left. He goes left. And I'm just about to collide into this guy and I stop. And he throws me an attitude. Like, I, and I wanted, and I, I just wasn't even worth saying it. But I'm like, dude, you just almost got into a collision. What if I was a car? Because everybody's zombified by this box. They need validation from the phone from social media, how many likes, how many hits, how many, I, I'm not even on social media, so I can't even tell you what, what it is. But it's, it's almost sad in a way because people have become powerless to the media. You know, I, I'm unfortunately a bit of a news junkie. Um, so I, I check in on the news sites, you know, multiple times a day and it's a bad habit because it's all toxic. And sometimes I'll read the comments about the stories. And the comments are vicious. You know, uh, someone drowns and then you get some idiot, well, he should have effing learned how to swim or, or they'll try to make some sort of snarky, tongue-in-cheek joke about a 12-year-old drowning or, you know, like, what the hell's wrong with you? And, and it's so toxic. But what happens is these young people buy into it, right? It's like if, if they're not socially popular, their life's over. You know, my, my, my high school, my alma mater, there was this beautiful young girl who someone started a rumor that she slept with the whole football team. And an hour later, she jumped in front of the commuter train on Staten Island and took her own life because it wasn't true. She didn't sleep with the whole football team. She was just dating one of the guys. But some vicious, jealous people, because she was very attractive, very intelligent, decided that they were going to crush her socially right emotional terrorists they're, they i don't like you so i'm gonna i'm gonna end you i'm gonna crush you cancel you and this poor little soul took her own life because she would rather die than not be popular or or i shouldn't say it that way but she the pain that it caused her by that vicious rumor she just couldn't get past that and it broke my heart i, I actually went to that train station one day and I prayed for her. I stopped where she is months later, but it bothered me so much as a father. And, and I literally sat at the train station and prayed. And I said, God, just please let this little angel be with you because she didn't deserve that, you know? Um, and I just feel that, that, that this, whole, this whole social media thing and, 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 and politicians and, and the media business are guilty of it. They are on a mission to have us divided into perpetuity. They want us to hate each other, be envious, be jealous. You know, um, they want everyone to believe that if you're a different color or different religion or different sex or, you know, identity or whatever, that, that you can't get along. You know, one of my dearest friends, he was one of my men uh, when I worked in Manhattan, Fitzroy Haynes Jr., this, Gentle, beautiful soul. His parents were Jamaican immigrants. His dad came here to join the United States Marines. And Fitzy followed his dad. And Fitzy then f finished up the Marines and joined the fire department. And on his very first shift in FDNY, 
he was night into day of 9-11. And one of the senior firefighters, when the call came in at about a quarter to nine, the shift doesn't end till nine. He threw Fitzy off. He said, you're not going, I got this. And Tommy Kelly went on that truck and Tommy Kelly died and Fitzy didn't. But Fitzy went there and dug and dug and dug and breathed in toxins for God knows how long, the, the nine months it took us to clear up. And uh, 2010, Christmas 2010, he died of a heart attack, 40 years old. And he was African-American and I was white. And I loved him like he was my brother. But the, the evil forces within the media and the press and social media, or whatever, they would lead you to believe that there was no way possible that I could love Fitzroy Haynes, that he could be my friend, my brother. And that pisses me off because people are getting fed such lies on a daily basis about stuff like that. And, and it's just so sad because why? Why would, why would these forces do that? Why would the media and the politicians just want this eternal divide because of money and because of power? And that's it. And sadly enough, we're all buying into, most of us are buying into it, you know. Uh, so you became a fireman, uh, what year? How old were you? I, I swore into the fire department on October 21st, 1990. And I was, uh, I had just turned 22 years old. And, uh, you know, one of the happiest days of my life. I, I, I uh, how long do you have to wait before I took the test in 1987? But you were a cop for how long? I was a cop for about 17 months, not even two years. It was quick. Uh, but I took the test. 77,000 people took the test in 1987, and they were going to hire about 2,500 guys and girls came from around the nation because you know, FDNY, you know, uh, we're kind of brash New Yorkers, right? We we think we're the best at everything. And, you know, what like our Yankees or Mets or football giants, well, they're in New Jersey. But uh, working on FDMY is like playing for the Yankees. You know, when I was a little kid playing baseball out in Staten Island, man, if you get to the Yankees, you made it. And uh, that's how I felt getting on the job. But now, unfortunately, there's people that are suing because they didn't get a fair chance at a test and uh, their school wasn't good enough and this and that. They're suing to get on the department. They're getting the job. They're getting back pay and a settlement. And they're refusing to go in to a fire because they didn't realize what they signed up for. You know, uh, you know no disrespect to, say, sanitation workers. Very defined job. Go clean up the city, pick up the trash. Fire department, respond to some dangerous crap. You know, you saw that crane accident yesterday right in Manhattan. I mean, that, that you, that's, that's, that's just on a daily basis in this city. They don't really pay you much money. Um, it's better nowadays than it was. I, I came on a job as a cop where you're making twelve fifty an hour. And if you made eleven fifty an hour, you were entitled to public, public benefits. So I was risking my life for... A dollar more an hour than someone sitting at home doing nothing. And now these people that are suing for this job, yeah, it's a great job. It's got great benefits. It's a great schedule. You work 24 hours, you're off 48, but a lot of times you come home, you're exhausted. You, you just spent 24 hours running around. And I won't lie to some nights, it's quiet, you don't do a lot, you know, but other nights, never come back. So, so, so it was shortly out. after you started that 9-11 happened. Yeah, no, I had 11 years. Um, I went to the first bombing in 1993. And uh, that was a real awakening for me because uh, at the time I worked in a ladder company 105. And uh, one of the men who molded me was Lieutenant uh, William Mudry. And he was tough, a tough guy. And uh, I fractured my back three years in and uh, I left his command to go out to acquire the place for a while to heal up because I was pretty hurt. And he, he was angry at me, but we, we forgave each other. Well, he forgave me, um, but he taught me the job. And uh, I wrote him a letter when I got promoted to lieutenant, thanking him. And I saw him, he thanked me for the letter. And on his last night on the job, I ran in with him on a fire. 
He was in a different company at the time and over time. And uh, he gave me a big hug. And Bill wasn't the type of guy to tell you he loved you. And he said, uh, I'm proud of you, kid. You came out good. I trained you right and you put it to work. Just never forget, it's all about your men and their safety. Everything else is just bullshit. And I said, thanks, boss. I said, get a lot of fishing in and enjoy yourself. And uh, that was in 2008, and I lost touch with him because Bill wasn't a phone call, text kind of guy. So about two years ago, I uh, decided I need to find him. I need to thank him personally. He doesn't know that I got sick and I had to retire, and I just want to let him know, hey, I wish I could have done my 35 years like I planned. I actually would have had 35 years last week. That was, no, I'm sorry, 34. So one more year. My plan was 35 and out. And I just want to let him know it got cut short, but, you know, he still trained me right, and I, and I never forgot what he said, protect your men, train your men. And one of my best buddies, Hugh, who's a retired fireman, cancer a couple times, now veterinarian, smart guy. He was in Sloan two years ago getting cancer surgery, and uh, his nurse was a fireman from 105. So he puts me on the phone and he says, hey, bro, I, I understand you used to work in 105. I said, yeah, yeah. And I said, how's my mentor, William Audrey? And that was a long pause. And he said, I'm sorry to tell you this, bro. And when someone does that nowadays, it's, he's gone. He died from 9-11. Well, Bill's lungs were compromised pretty badly. 33 years on the job, busy, busy trucks and 9-11. And uh, he succumbed to COVID. Guy was healthy as a horse. And he got a bunch of fishing in down in Florida like he wanted. But and he died 71 years old. And he should have lived way longer than that. And uh, I never got that chance to thank him. But I was with him in 1993 at the bombing. And the senior firefighter uh, driving a truck, Henry Miller. And tradition in the FDNY is a senior man. He looks out for you. He trains you. He chastises you. Pun not somewhat punishes you, but when you F up, they let you know. But they're there to guide you, teach you, and inspire you. So I was with Hank that day, and I was under his wing as his you know, junior man. He's the senior man. I'm sticking to his side with the lieutenant. We go to the first bombing a couple hours after as an extra company to help out, and uh, Hank looks around, and he just said, you know, they didn't do it right, kid. He says uh, they blew it off in the middle here. When he goes, if they did it in the corner, you got a supporting column. He says they would have dropped this building in Canal Street. And he said, mark my word, they'll come back and they'll do it right. And it'll be in your lifetime, in your career. And the cruel irony was on the morning of 9-11, Hank was driving 105. And one of my lieutenants who taught me the job, a lot about being a man, about being a dad, his his proby, as we call our rookies, proby son, was on a truck with Hank, 105. And Dennis Jr. died with Hank that morning. Hank saw it right. He prophesied that he knew it. He knew these evil bastards would not give up without taking those buildings now. And he was one of the first guys I thought of when I got in there. I was, I was off duty driving a moonlight in Staten Island an oil truck and uh, raced in. Got to my firehouse, 114 at the time. They were there. Dennis Senior was working in charge of the crew for the day from 114, knowing his son was responding in as he was responding in. And my childhood best friend, John Sharp, one block, one avenue down in engine 201, responding in. And I'm racing in off duty. Get to the firehouse, I call into command, to the battalion, and they said, get a city bus, get as many guys who sign in and get down there. Guys come racing in from home, side jobs, whatever they were doing. We get whatever gear we could get. We stop a city bus in the street, we commandeer it. Never forget the guy, John. He says, I'm sorry, I can't give you the bus, I'll drive you. I says, do you understand you're going into a war zone? He says, I can't give you my bus. I know you have to get there. He drove us. And as we came over to Brooklyn Bridge, 
first tower was already down, and we heard 114 go on scene, signal 1084. 114's nickname is Tally Ho. It's from an old airborne ranger, Jack Carroll, who came back from World War II, jumped Normandy. And when they used to jump out the planes, they yelled Tally Ho. So when we first got radios, Jack refused to say 10-4. So when they asked for, they'd send you on a dispatch call on the radio, you're supposed to follow up with 10-4, you'd say 114, tally ho, you hang up the radio. And dispatchers would get pissed. He just kept doing it. And then it stuck. And now all these years later, out of 350 engines and ladders, it's the only fire company in New York City that sometimes get called by their nickname and not their numerical designation. So Dennis put them on scene. Tally Ho with 1084, Church and, uh, Church and Vesey or West and Vesey, checking into the command post. And all of a sudden now, 30, 40 minutes later, we're coming over that bridge. Second tower goes down right in front of us. And I just said, all my friends are dead. And I didn't get there on time. 